You are Locked On Auburn, your daily podcast on the Auburn Tigers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, welcome on into Locked On Auburn, your daily Auburn Tigers podcast. I'm your host, Zach Blackerby. And joining me today, as he does every Friday for a Ferg Friday, Justin Ferguson with the Auburn Observer. Man, I haven't talked to you since the season started. It's uh, it's <laughs> crazy how quick we just got to get in gear for this thing. Oh, yeah. I was I was telling you before we started recording, uh, my body was not ready for the start of football season the way it is. That first night game, so you have that late Saturday night work in. You know, we record early on Sunday morning for our podcast. I'm watching the game for the rest of the day on Sunday to put out the film room on, out on Monday. Right, uh, and then and then you got a then you got the Harson press conference on Monday afternoon, and man, a Tuesday I woke up and I was like, I'm tired. I don't feel great. Uh, I, but I, I you, man. We've recovered now. We're we're good. 11 a.m. game against an FCS team. It was good to ease back into things. That's right. That's right. And I know a lot of folks don't like 11 o'clock games, but uh, for us, it's amazing. I, I like best them. games you can get. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I've got to go uh, board up and train some board ops for after the game, our, our post game show on ESPN one six seven. I I would much rather do that after an eleven o'clock game than like a six o'clock game. So, and my wife 100%. would rather me do that as well. So, hundred uh, percent. I mean, everybody yeah. wins except for fans, but you know, at least we can act like we're the most important people here. Uh, yeah, we can act like it. It's not true. But we can act like <laughs> it's, it. it's not true at all. But <laughs> so watching that game, they look better than I thought. That seems to be kind of the the consensus across folks. I mean, purposely giving you a broad question here. Yeah. How do you think they looked? I was really impressed with how clean the game was. Now, I, you know, I wrote about this in the mailbag on Friday. I, there was nothing about the results that necessarily blew me away. Like, it was good. It was really, really good in some areas. But, like, Akron's horrible. And, like, they're, they're going to be one of the worst teams in the country this year on both sides of the ball. Yeah. So, Auburn did what a team – with Auburn's talent level should do against a team with Akron's talent level and size. However, it's just the cleanliness of it was interesting. Hardly any penalties, no turnovers. So it seemed like there wasn't really any communication breakdowns, maybe just kind of one or two times where things were a little iffy operations wise. Week one, game one of a, of a year one can be really challenging in that regard, right? So take away, it doesn't matter who you put on the field. It could be any team, air, it doesn't matter. A lot of the stuff that it's internal for Auburn looked really good. Yeah. And I think it was like, you know, you didn't see guys bust coverages on defense. You didn't see guys seem like they were too far out of position at any point. Guys were running the right routes. Bo Nix right. knew where to go with them because they were there. All that stuff. I mean, it doesn't matter who you're playing against. That's good stuff. And you go back to week one of the season, how many good football programs, how many Power Five teams, with not first-year coaches, either struggled in the first half, took a while to get going, or straight up lost, like in the case of Washington and Montana, yeah. teams they had no business, you know, they should have blown out. Right. So the fact that Auburn did that in the way they did that, I think is it should be, I mean, it shows that I think they might be a little bit more ahead of the curve than we thought they would be at this point, which is a great sign because uh, th this first half of the schedule, I think, for Auburn, you know, after week one, maybe looks a little bit more manageable if A, you're ahead of schedule, and B, if LSU and Penn State kind of look like they did on uh, on last Saturday. But, of course, there's a lot of improvement to do for every team between week one and week two. Is it an okay mindset, Jay Ferg, to have – you mentioned – I've mentioned it too this week, but the whole – well, everyone else really struggled or lost or kind of stunk it up or just survived – is that an okay mindset to have kind of looking at other folks throughout the conference and throughout the country? Or, you know, is Auburn just kind of looking at Auburn and saying like, nah, what happens outside of here doesn't really matter. I think, I think for Auburn, they, they view it as, Hey, we did everything we were supposed to do, supposed to do in week one. Let's do it in week two. And if yeah. we keep doing that, once the competition steps up, we're going to be more prepared for it. I think for a fan base and externally, you can look at Auburn and say, okay, how did other teams struggle, right? Was it a case of um, them not being on the same page, breaking new players in, breaking new systems in, or was it just they just kind of got beat um, or, or right. you know, struggled? I, I, think of, I think of all the things that have stuff to do with the quality of opponent, right? Auburn played one of the worst teams they could play on Saturday. There's going to be some FCS teams that had really good performances against good teams in week one that would probably beat Akron. 
So you got to keep that in mind. But how did it work? Like Auburn was efficient on both sides of the ball. Uh, They played well at the line of scrimmage. And it's a completely different system in a different situation. And you know that there's more talent there. But, I mean, UCLA blew the doors off of LSU at the line of scrimmage. Right. And, like, that shouldn't happen, right? So Ever. you start feeling a little bit more, okay, Penn State played one of the only ranked versus ranked games of the of the week when they played Wisconsin, right? There were some things that Penn State did well in that game, and there were some things Penn State didn't do so well in that game. There's a lot of things Penn State did not do well in that game. So you, so you can start adjusting, okay, well, if Auburn does what it's supposed to do and you put that into the context of when the competition gets better, you're not going to blow them out. But, like, if you play clean football – against some teams that have shown some noticeable weaknesses early, you're in a good spot. Sure. And it was such a refreshing thing for Auburn folks to see a team come out week one Mm -hmm. and look sharp. I mean, you and I both liked Gus. You and I both said a lot of good things about Gus. But one of his critiques from Auburn fans and folks throughout the SEC was, it seems like it always took him five or six games to figure things out. That does not appear to be the case this year. Yeah, the slow starts on offense were a real thing. And look, we will see in two weeks how far along this offense really is when sure. they play Penn State. Um, but yeah, they they knew what they were doing from the beginning, and they got the ball to them. Now, it helped the, that you played the worst defense in FBS, um, and these guys were running open. And then there were, you know, the offensive line could, could dominate up front because Akron just did not have nearly enough size to compete with Auburn. However, it, it, it seemed like they just knew what they were doing. It was a game plan that it was well drilled, well executed. And yes, it wasn't perfect, but you got what you wanted on the ground. Bo Nix had his most efficient day potentially ever uh, as, as an Auburn quarterback. You saw some new position groups or some guys at new, new guys at position groups and some players step up. And like that's that's a really good sign for your offense. I think defensive. We've seen Auburn's defenses be rock solid from game one in the past. Mm-hmm. I think it was the offense this time. They had an identity, and that identity was be balanced, do some of everything, and kind of work the ball to all levels of the field, spread it around, get the ground game going, uh, run downhill, and that'll be repeated this week against Alabama State. They'll take that into they'll take that into Penn State, and from here moving forward, I think. You're going to see tweaks. You're going to see uh, changes. You're going to see um, different guys step up or you know kind of move up and down the depth chart. Uh, importance to the offense. You'll see new plays. You'll see new concepts. You'll see new routes and stuff like that. Yep. But they ran their base stuff really, really well in, in in week one, and that's a great sign because it doesn't look like they're having to try to figure out you know who they're going to be able to rely on. You're absolutely right. Justin Ferguson, our guest with the Auburn Observer. Today's show brought to you by our friends at Built Bar, the best tasting protein bar on the planet. All their bars, very low in calories, very high in protein, and they're delicious. Also, you can get 15% off today. All you have to do is go to built.com, place your order, use promo code LOCKED15, L-O-C-K-E-D-1-5, LOCKED15 for 15% off. That's at built.com. Justin Ferguson with the Auburn Observer. What all is going on these days with the Observer? We are in in in-season mode, baby. Yeah, I would like to uh, shout out everybody who jumped on board with the uh, the week one, year one deal. Uh, we are barreling towards a thousand subscribers now. Awesome. We picked up well over a hundred last week alone. Yes, and that was great. really that was really cool to see. So appreciate all you guys for uh, joining up there. Yeah, we're in game week, and, and game weeks are going to be kind of follow the same sort of format moving forward. But here's what you got this week. You got the film room on Monday, did a story up on Tuesday, was on the pass rush uh, and and, and TD Moultrie and and all the impressive stuff on that side of the ball. Uh, Wednesday, uh, we had a uh, we had a story on Alan Flanagan. So keeping an eye on basketball, obviously, throughout uh, throughout this offseason podcast with Dan Peck uh, joined Painter and I to preview week two and have some fun there. Uh, That was for our subscribers. Mailbags up on Friday Uh, and then Saturday, you know, either. Saturday night or Sunday morning, you will get post-game observations, thousands and thousands of words of what we just saw, kind of breaking it down for you in a lot of different ways. Uh, and then uh, we, we do a, a recap podcast on Sunday. Usually comes around uh, out around noon on Sundays where you listen to podcasts. So if you want all of that sent to your email inbox, it's pretty much something every single day uh, yep. at about 6 a.m. Central Time. Um, go to auburnobserver.com, sign up. 
six dollars a month or sixty dollars a year and get you access to it. And once you're in and you're paid, everything we do gets sent to your inbox so you can read it and you can listen on your own time. You don't have to wait for a link or you don't have to go to a website. We send right. it straight to you. Yeah. And something I said about your work in the past that I want people to know is Justin's work, Justin's goal in his writing is to make you a smarter fan about all things Auburn sports, uh, Auburn football, and Auburn basketball. And a prime example is his film rooms. He does such a great job teaching folks what is happening on the field. Like one of the things that you pointed out, Justin, that I'd love to talk about in your Monday film room mm -hmm. was all of the motions involved in his offense. Looks a yeah. little different. Uh, you know, and, and we've talked about that before. Pre-snap, we kind of talked about the pre-snap stuff on offense through the lens of like, of Bo Nix and what all it means, but what all did you see happening pre-snap that stood out to you Saturday? It was a wide variety of motions. Motion is the hot thing in football at all levels. It, you know, I follow some people who cover the NFL and, and write about the NFL in some yeah. like, really high high level detail. And one of the big things for them now is like, if you're not doing pre-snap motion a lot, you're really hurting yourself because you, you can do so much with it, right? You affect defenses. Uh, you can, you know, you can overload certain spots. You can uh, read deeper with it before the snap. And what we saw, even though this was kind of a vanilla offense on Saturday from Auburn, saw a ton of ton of pre-snap motion. Um, yeah. You know, I can't remember the exact number off the top of my head, but the first team snaps a lot of pre-snap motion there, and it was it was a variety of guys. You saw halfbacks going into orbit motion. Uh, you saw wide receivers going jets or flies. What is um, orbit motion, Justin, for those so, who don't know? So orbit motion is the one you probably think of the most when you think of a running back going in motion. They're lined up behind the quarterback at the snap, and then they make like a like a loop, like a little circle loop, and then go up You know, in, in motion. That is called orbit motion. There's fly motion and jet motion. Uh, the easiest way, to, they, they're the same thing, but the easiest way to go with that is jet motion, um, The it, it gets snapped. The ball gets snapped before they get there. Fly motion it gets snapped after they get there. Um, you have guys going in and out. Uh, tight ends move around a lot. You saw right. the uh, the fourteen personnel play where they shifted the fullback and the tight end to overload one side right before the snap. They do a lot of that. There's a lot of manipulation, a lot of shifts, and it's all designed to get the defense to think. Right, it, it, the Brian Harson and Mike Bobo offense. And almost like the 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 Derek Mason defense as well is designed to make everybody think. And if you have to be prepared for anything, it's going to make it a lot tougher for you for you to defend it, right? Yep. Um, and so that is that was the big thing with these 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 pre stat motions. Everybody got involved. You saw slot receivers, outside receivers, running backs, tight ends, fullbacks, everybody moving around. And that's going to be a key thing moving forward. It was it was really the um, it was really the big. One of the big calling cards of Brian Harson's offenses at Boise State from the time he was a head coach and back when he was an offensive coordinator. And it's kind of the new wave of pro style offenses. I tell Auburn fans, you know, they ran a ton of shotgun on Saturday. Uh, only a few plays were under center. Um, so when you think pro style, don't think I formation, fullback, everybody going, you know, going under center, running downhill. Think of pro style offenses. I, I think the best examples of it are look out on the West Coast. Where in the NFL, where you see the San Francisco 49ers and the Los Angeles Rams, they do sure. a lot of multiple stuff, varied things like that. A lot of shifts, a lot of personnel changes and, and formation. Maybe not as much with the Rams, but definitely the the Niners. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a lot of similarities between the gr two groups. That's what you got to start thinking of, and not just think, oh, pro style. It's going to look like you know old school football. Uh, not always. Right. Yeah, and I think the cool thing about all of this is. And, and not to bring up Gus again, but like the, the jump from that type of preparation for the offense to what we saw on Saturday. And you have to assume it will get more complex when they play a better team like Penn State in a few weeks. And then we go, when they go on the road to LSU, of course, there's just a lot more information that these guys are having to take in to get ready for these games. Yeah. We talked about all offseason, how much more complex the system's going to be, but they seem to handle it great. And Harson talked about it in his presser earlier in the week about how there were like no mental mistakes, like mm -hmm. to be able to put that on the field for the first time when it's all just kind of been theory so far, and right. there be no mental mistakes is pretty incredible. Right. And it, it just builds on it moving forward. And I think it's a lot of like this offense is going to be built and defense is going to be very game plan centric, right? It's going to be based on the opponent. 
Uh, that is more of the NFL style, more of the pro style type of way of going at it. You know, there's some really good college offenses and defenses throughout the country. Uh, I think of Oklahoma as one of them. Yes, they do game planning and they and they do stuff like that. But a lot of it is like you know what you're going to get out of them. Oklahoma maybe only runs like seven or eight plays on offense. They're going to drill it in there and then get it get it humming. Um, right. and, and when Auburn's offense and defense under Gus Malzahn work, it was kind of the same way, right? You knew what was coming. It was just can we out execute you and beat you uh, in those in those areas. This one's going to be more, I think, adapted to who you're playing, what their tendencies are, what our tendencies are. Tweak, adapt, and go on that moving forward. Because if you're an offense that has no problem going five wide and no problem going goal line heavy and going back and forth and and being heavy and throwing deep off of it or sp- spreading it out wide wide and running downhill uh, with it. That makes you uh, that makes you a team that's going to be tougher to game plan for, and it'll make it easier for you to game plan for certain teams. You don't have to jam your own philosophy into okay, how are we going to make this work against this defense? It's like okay, this is what they do. Here's what we can do to beat that. Right. Yeah, I think it's going to be awesome to watch today's show. Brought to you by Stat Hero. We've all heard of daily fantasy sports. If you haven't gotten into it. Uh, you know, this is a great opportunity to, but did you know that 85% of people who play daily fantasy sports lose? And this is, uh, this is how stat hero works to kind of take advantage of that. Uh, they show you their lineup, then it's you against the house. So if you think you can put together a daily fantasy sports lineup to beat the house at stat hero, all you have to do is go to stathero.com slash locked on and sign up for free right now. And you get three times back on your first play free money. They're giving you 300% match. That's unheard of. Go to stathero.com slash locked on. That is stathero.com slash locked on. Justin Ferguson, our guest. So my biggest question to you now, I guess, is, okay, we got a lot of information about this team this past Saturday, Jay Ferg. What do you think will be the biggest difference or the biggest focus heading into tomorrow's game? I think it's going to be a lot of just tightening it up. Um, they might add some more things, but like you can kind of be vanilla on offense and on defense and still be yeah. good. I think, you know, somebody asked me, what's the biggest, like, oh, the biggest improvement comes from week one and week two. Where's the improvement? I think generally it's just like just getting more comfortable in this offense, getting more comfortable in this defense. I think you're going to see guys get to play with a little bit more. Um, they'll be able to kind of cut it loose a little bit more, I think. If, if there's one specific move that I would say, okay, maybe they'll do better on this. I would think it's the secondary. That's probably the one group from Saturday where you're like, yeah, they probably could have tightened it up more. Uh, Smoke Monday himself said that after the game uh, sure. on Saturday. And and yes, Auburn's going to play a lot of off man. They're going to play a lot of zone. They're going to keep a lot of stuff in front of them. And and Akron had no. They were like, we are not going to throw it deep because if we try to throw it deep, they are going to kill our quarterback. And uh-huh. so when the backup came into the game and Auburn was rotating guys in that defense. He was doing a good job just getting the ball, boom, get it out of, it, out of his hands. He made a couple of good downfield throws, some things Auburn can tighten up on. They might, they will look better, I think, on pass defense uh, Saturday against Alabama State. We'll see how much of it is just execution or just the way the game flow goes. But, yeah, I think it's just this is going to look a lot like game one, and it's just going to be a matter of just getting more comfortable and locked into this offense. And, and, honestly, I think the improvement may come from getting to play more guys in the second half. They didn't really do that a ton on Saturday, uh, especially on defense, maybe you're in a better spot to get get them in there uh, uh, against Alabama State. Sure, sure. What did you think about um, – you, you talked about Bo looking great. What did you think about Finley coming in uh, in the second half there? Yeah, so uh, Finley, I, I think it was the thing that I've heard about Finley throughout this offseason is that he's definitely talented. Everybody can see that. He's got yeah. a great arm. Um, he's huge and, like, there's going to be a time when he's going to be a really good quarterback for this offense. Right now, Bo Nix is more ahead of him in the offense, right? Bo takes a snap, knows where to go with the ball. You could see that on Saturday. Finley is two of five. It was a little, it was a little tougher for him. It didn't seem like he was quite as quick trigger with it. And we don't know the play calls and the design and what all they were trying to go for with him out there. But, you know, I thought Finley, I mean, Harson said, I thought he made some good decisions out there, made some good throws. You know, might not have always worked out for him. You know, you go two two for five. I think it's very effective that you have a six, seven quarterback that you can get him, go get him to go under center and uh, get that quarterback sneak. That might be something they could use down the road. How right? do you stop that? I mean, yeah, what? exactly. Uh, where, I mean, here's the other thing that running back group between tank and Sean and Sean Jackson and Jarquez Hunter, those are four dudes that are going to be hard to bring down anyway. But yeah, there's right. something that's like, I need a yard. 
here, you're six seven, and you have the shortest distance forward. to go. Yeah, <laughs> you, you have the shortest distance to go of any, anyone. Um, but no, I think I think Finley. It, it just showed that yes, he's got potential, and there's a lot to like about him moving forward. But Nick's had the head start in this offense. He had several months of a head start. He's got a whole year of experience ahead of him uh, or ahead of, of Finley. And I think it was just very obvious in, in the way that was working out. And, and so that's why they trusted him to you know be with the first team. And whereas Finley, he's just got more work to do. And I think we heard at the end of fall camp, the light was starting to come on for, for Finley and he was starting to click. And I think that'll continue to happen. Um, but I think that game really reinforced why Nick's is the guy right now. Do you think we see more Jarquez Hunter tomorrow? I think there's a really good chance for for that. Um, I think Auburn really wanted to establish the fact that they wanted to get Tank Bigsby the ball and give him what he had, probably what, 10, 11, 12 touches in that game. Yeah. And they might do that again tomorrow because Tank can be a 100-yard guy on those against a, a weak opponent. I mean, shout out to Sean Chavers, by the way. Touches the ball three times and scores on two of them. Um, oh, two of them were great, big plays, too. Great, yeah, great, get, uh, great game from him. But yeah, I think Hunter it, he showed that man, he's got it. He's he's got a lot of the the you know, when you look at a freshman running back, you can just see in the way they move and the way they accelerate, the way they cut, the vision that you can be ahead of the curve. And this dude's been a diamond in the rough since he showed up for Auburn. Um, but I did watch him and yes, it's it's yes, it's uh a very bad defense he was going up against and he's going to go up against a bad defense tomorrow. But I kind of had flashbacks in that game to the 2011 uh, Chick-fil-A Bowl when Auburn played Virginia. If you remember correctly in that game, Trey Mason looked like he was shot out of a cannon every time he touched the ball, especially in the second half. He was the only like remote bright spot the Auburn offense had in 2012, 1,000-yard season. And then, of course, he becomes a Heisman finalist in 13. Not saying Hunter's going to follow that career path, but I did kind of get flashbacks of like, man, that's a freshman that's looking really, really good running the ball. And so, yeah, I think you could see more of them, and I think you could also see Jordan Ingram get involved. I think you could see Sean Jackson get involved as well. Sean Jackson looks good. I mean, I thought he scored on the first touch he had. Yeah, I did too. And then they took him out. What's up with that? Uh, well, I mean, I think they were just really wanting to establish Hunter there, but it'll yeah. be interesting to see how it goes. And I'm interested to see if uh, Jordan Ingram – Ingram is a fascinating back to me because he's taller than the other guys in that room, and he's got, I think, a little bit more natural receiver ability um uh, about him so i wonder if he could like car different offenses of course but like early early career carry on johnson type of role might be might be something that you could see with him moving forward but i mean look you're going to want to give the ball to tank as much as you can you want to give the ball to sean chavis because he's super effective and look jark was jark was hunter's done exactly what we thought he was going to be heading into uh heading into the uh the season boy they found a gym with him there's no question about it justin how can people sign up for the auburn observer and what all do they get when they do so AuburnObserver.com, you get about four or five newsletters a week, two um, podcasts a week as well, uh, sent straight to your email inbox. AuburnObserver.com, $6 a month, $60 a year, sign up, and it all comes in your inbox. Worth every penny, folks. Worth every penny. All right, we'll be back on Monday to talk about everything that happened over the weekend, and it'll be Penn State week. We've waited forever for it. It's almost here. Follow me on Twitter at ZBlack. Be a show on Twitter at LockedOnAuburn and on Instagram at Auburn Podcast. We'll see you Monday. This has been Locked on Auburn.